Sister Lindsay. <laughs> Good morning. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Wave your hand if you can hear me. Okay. You can't right. hear me? Okay, can you hear me? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. 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 That um, there will be other people coming in. I want to welcome everyone to the leadership masterclass on this only Saturday. I mean, just think of that. Uh, I mean, in a matter of hours, we're going to be commemorating. A risen king. Now that's good news. Yeah. Now we're gonna have church right now. No, I don't want to get on that. We're gonna have some book learning today. Um, and um, but first, a few um, the housekeeping things here. We're working on some things right now. But uh, if you if you're logged into Zoom right now, we're asking that you would uh, log out of Zoom uh, to help reduce or eliminate uh, any type of feedback. And uh, online, uh, if you will remain muted till you're ready to contribute with a question or uh, you have a concern or something like that, we'd appreciate that as well. All right, now, uh, the, uh, the subject matter expert, also known as the host, is well qualified to bring forth the information that you're going to be getting today. He is a um, he possesses a medical doctorate from the Yale School University School of Medicine, and also a Juris Doctorate from the uh, Western um, University. He's also the president of Choctaw Medical Group. I like to present to some and introduce to others. Dr. William Choctaw. Robert Andrew Collins. Good morning, everybody. What I want to do right now is, is right quickly so we can go into this. I want to read you a scripture. It is based on, and the Lord, the Lord is so good because, you know, he gave me this, this scripture Tuesday. But guess what? Last night, we spoke on last night. Last said the Lord just confirmed that, you know. So but anyway, it's uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 12. And it reads thus, Who have believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He have no form nor commonness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with the grief, and with the hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we didn't did esteem him stricken, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisements of our peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears, dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make him his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, 
He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many? For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore would I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. May God have a blessing on here and read of his holy word. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God Almighty, we come to you this morning, my Father. First of all, I just want to thank you. Thank you for our lying down last night and our rising up this morning and closing our right mind with all our spiritual, physical, and mental capacities functioning properly. Thank you for bringing us to this point in time, my Father, where you can be able to listen, my Father, to words that you've given our speaker to give to us this morning, my Father, concerning obesity, my Father. Father God Almighty, we pray, my Father, that we will please you, that we will go out and share your word with others and let them know that you are the way, the truth, and the light, and all things are possible with you. Bless my Father, Dr. Charta, fill it with your Holy Spirit, wisdom, and knowledge, so you can be able to present to us what you have given him to present, my Father. And Father God Almighty, we will be so very careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in your daughter and son, Jesus Christ, holy name, amen. Dr. Amen. Chakta. Good morning. Welcome to the fourth um, leadership masterclass. Um, and let me say, let me just sort of take a moment to say that this is... Uh, <laughs> We're starting our second quarter with the, with the master class. Um, and we're absolutely delighted to have you all here. Um, and let me also say, you know, the first uh, master class, we talked about mental health issues. Uh, second, we followed with um, uh, health uh, regulations and, and patient rights. Third, we followed with mental health issues times two. And today we're gonna to talk about obesity, fact and fiction. So thank you again for being with us and we'll go ahead and start. And I will share my screen. Thank you. I, let me say I have <laughs> technical advisors. <laughs> so you, you may see them jump up and move around. And just don't worry about it. This is just this is how we roll, okay? This is how we roll. This is the team. This is the team. Uh, and you can't see him, but Jess is over in the corner doing doing his thing also. I might also I might also thank uh, my what I call my production team, because a lot of you may not know who they are. Uh, Robin Collins, uh, Jesse Hammonds, Tony McClendon, uh, Pastor Rivas, uh, uh, Robin Nickens, um, uh, Mr. Stella, um, um, and uh, Pastor Dockery. Uh, so I want to say to all those who've been so helpful in getting us to this point. And as I said, this is our very fourth uh, presentation. As I've said before, this is a result of my 50 years of medical practice, of medical and surgical practice. And basically, these presentations are lessons my patients have taught me. And I guarantee you, I've learned so much. More. I know so much more now than I did 50 years ago. Things that I thought I've learned were not true. Things that I thought were true, I learned uh, were true indeed. And so uh, we, we continue to move ahead with that. I believe that life is about being of, being of service to others. I believe that knowledge is power. I believe that leaders can change the world. Most of these masterclass uh, presentations are gonna be about three main topics, uh, medicine, uh, law, and finance. And many times they will all be mixed together like the one today. I wanna make a request. No, it's not a request, this is a requirement. <laughs> If, if you are a part of the masterclass, your requirement is you must get or have access to 
a academic hand computer. Now you may say, you know, Dr. Choctaw, those look awful like, uh, like uh, cell phones. Well, they are cell phones. Uh, I just renamed them uh, academic hand computers. And, what, and what's my point here? My point is, I expect you as members of the master class to do homework, to do homework. And what does that mean? I expect you to, anything that you have a question about, you obviously can ask questions in class, but I expect you to look them up yourself. Um, I have, I have uh, six grandchildren. And when my oldest grandson was four years old, I called him over and I said, I want to tell you something. And he said, okay, his, his name is Vincent. Um, and I whispered a word in his ear. And I said, this is a secret word. And I want you to always remember this secret word. And he said, okay, granddad, because he's my grandson. And he does what I say. <laughs> Uh, and, and the secret word that I mentioned to him was Google, Google. And I said, I want you to always remember that word. He's 17 now. And I will still go up to him and I said, what was the secret word? He said, Google. So, uh, so what's my point? My point was you can find out anything you want to know on the computer, basically. Good or bad, but you can find it out on the computer. Those of us who are in the baby boomer generation, and I'm, I'm post 70, uh, we didn't have, you know, laptop computers. We didn't have um, um, personal computers at home. That was a guy down the street who came selling encyclopedias. Some of you probably know what, I know most of you don't know what an encyclopedia is, <laughs> but some of you might know what an encyclopedia is. And, and, and you know, and your parents would try to struggle and, and put some money up to get an encyclopedia so you could learn some stuff. Well, you got all that in the presence of your academic hand computer. Th doesn't matter what kind of model you have, doesn't matter. Uh, but at your fingertips, you can look up anything. And so my point is, I, I expect you as part of your homework to always be looking up stuff, looking up words, looking up phrases, looking up stuff you hear on the news, looking up conversations. And what's, what's the point of that? Is that this is the process of learning, right? This is what learning is. Someone wants to find, define education as receiving information that changes behavior. Receiving information that changes behavior. I used to say to people, I said, you want me to be a better person? Teach me, educate me. If you educate me, I'll, I'll act better. I'll, I'll be better. Uh, and so my point is that the way we know that these master classes have had an effect is you're gonna be different in December when we do number 12, right? Uh, you're going to be different. And so part of that process is, is you starting to do those things now, just the way you roll, just the way you do stuff. So again, uh, I want you to keep it with you. You know, and again, it, it doesn't matter what, what, what type you use or how, how you use it. But every day I want you to do that. And in this class, we're not going to have you turn in homework because I trust you. I trust you. So if I ask you to do it, I know you'll do it. <laughs> so I, I don't need for you to prove to me what I already know, right? Okay, all right. And, and let me just parenthetically say, I, that was not my philosophy, that whole process. True story, and I'll make this real quick. All of my life in high school and in college, I have always taken those Friday exams. You, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you have this class and every Friday there's an exam and you get an 80 or a 70 or a 50 or whatever, and you add up the numbers. Because, you know, then you're going to have midterms and then you're going to have finals. So you sort of knew what your grade was going to be because you were always adding up the numbers because you had exams every Friday, right? I kid you not. When I started medical school, um, the professor walked out first year and he said, we will have no exams in Yale Medical School. I said, how can you have no exams in medical school? That didn't make any sense to me. He said, we, I, he said you, you will not have Friday exams. Uh, you will not have exams in two weeks. You will have two exams your whole four years here at Yale. It'll be in two years and in four years. The rest is up to you. And I said, oh, my God. What do I, I had no idea what to do. I, I, all my life, I had depended on exams, you know, to, to teach me, to tell me what I need to do and where I need to go fast or slower. But they said, no, there are no exams here. And so, obviously, a lot of us are raising our hands. How can you do it? And, and, the, and I remember Professor Creeland, he said, 
if you got in here, we know you're good. So we don't need to give you an exam to find out how good you are. But you have a responsibility and you're going to have to do it yourself. We're going to help you. you. We expect you to be an adult. And I'm going, oh my God. And what I would choose for it, you know, you'd be eating, cap eating lunch in the cafeteria and something, you'd over here come to somebody and say, well, you know, I just read 30 pages of Beeson last night, one of the books. And I said, oh my God, I only read 15. So I, I'd go back, <laughs> I'd go back and read another 15. Yeah, you know, but it was, it was extremely insecure. But I tell you, that was the best thing in the world for me. Because now I don't need an exam. I mean, and my, the point I'm trying to make is, if I decide to do something, I figure out a way to do it. I don't rely on a system to sort of teach me how to do it. I know that I can figure it out by myself. And that knowledge is invaluable or has been invaluable to me. Hi, come on in. Welcome, welcome. So my point is, as a member of the master class, I'm not going to help you with this. <laughs> I'm not. I, I, I'm going to put it all on you uh, for you to figure it out. Uh, with your with your academic computer, uh, but, and sorry, you can ask me questions. I don't mind that. Uh, but my point is, uh, in December when we do number twelve, you will know how to do this, and you won't you won't have to use uh, uh, ask anybody what to do or what not to do. Okay, moving right along. As always, we always like to give you an outline, and the purpose of the outline is to let you know what we're going to talk about. And, um, and specifically, we're going to talk about the definition of obesity. I'm a big believer in definitions, big believer in definitions. Why? Because if you're in a group, if you're talking to somebody and I say um, Thomas and somebody else says Johnson, if we don't define what those terms mean, we have no idea what we're talking about. And it ends up being a wasted conversation. Uh, so I believe it's important to always define things. We're going to talk about BMI, body mass index. Now, most of you know this already, but we're going to go over it in detail. Uh, diet, the diet exercise myth. Uh, uh, we're going to certainly go back to our brain um, and brain issues. And we're going to talk, we're going to end up talking about treatment. Definitions. Mayo Clinic defines obesity as adding more fat than muscle. Real simple definition. Adding more fat than muscle. Okay. Uh, and specifically, and we'll get into this in detail later on, we're going to talk about body mass index. That's what BMI means, body mass index. And we're going to talk about the body mass index that's over 30. We're going to make reference to diabetes, but we're talking about, but when I say diabetes today, I'm talking about diabetes type 2, like diabetes type 1, and I'm only talking about diabetes type 2. Okay, what is a body mass index? Well, basically it's just a scale that somebody came up with that compa compares your weight, which is along the top of the scale, we call it the x-axis, and your height, which is on the side, what we call the y-axis. I'm sure some of you remember back in high school, the x-y-axis type thing. So let me give you an example. I'm five feet, five inches tall. So you go to the, to the, to this, the vertical side and you find five, five, and then you go all the way across and I weigh 158 pounds. So you take five, five all the way over uh, and you, you can see that my BMI is about 25. It's in the yellow, 25, okay? The colors here mean the blue is underweight, the green is normal weight, the yellow is overweight, the orange is obesity, which is what we're going to talk about today, and the, the red is excessive obesity. Let me say that again. The blue is underweight, the green is normal weight, the yellow is overweight, the orange is obesity, which is what we're going to talk about today, and the red is overweight. So let's take a look see. Say these are this is body mass index for men. The numbers are the same. So basically, if you are less than 18 BMI, body mass index, you're underweight. If you're 18 to 24.9, you're normal. 
If you're 25 to 29, you're overweight and over 30, you're obese. All right, real, real basic stuff, pretty simple. But I, I, but again, this is a master class, so we don't do anything simple, right? So I want you to, uh, whenever you see that word or you see the word normal, ask yourself a question. What is normal? What, what, what do they mean by normal? Normal to who, right? Because normal really does vary, right? Because it's a reference. It's a reference. So my point is that when you when you hear people on the news talking about normal, or when you uh, even in a class they talk about normal, always ask the question, "What is normal?" Now these are supposed to be the normal body masses for men with the body mass in there. These are the normal body masses for women with the body mass index. Numbers basically the same. But let me ask you a question. Is this normal for most women in your family? When you think about it, do most women in your family, I'm not talking about adults, no, not children. Uh, do most women in your family normally look this way? I'm gonna to submit to you probably not. I'm gonna to submit to you probably not. And so my point is this brings up one of the challenges in healthcare. Healthcare is not perfect. It is not perfect. Regardless of what we say, it's not perfect. Number one, part of that imperfection is that data is based on the majority, um, uh, the majority group or the majority population, right? So data, let's say if you have 100 people and 80 people look one way and five people look another way and 15 look another way, it's based on how those 80 people look. It's not based on how the five or the 15 people look, right? So my point is, that normal many times can end up sitting one down, down a road that is not uh, completely accurate. So what, what are some of the flaws of the body mass index? One of the flaws is, uh, and we know this, that women have more fat than men, okay? Not a good thing or a bad thing, just the way it is, right? Women have more estrogen, men have more te testosterone. So that there's an extra layer of fat that women have that men don't have. Secondly, the, body, the amount of body fat changes with different racial and ethnic groups. Again, you know this, look around your family, look around your neighborhood, look, look at your friends, your buddies, or whatever, whatever, and you can tell you, and, and again, going back to that word normal, so I, I don't like to use the word normal. I will say average, or I will say majority. Um, uh, and so I, I just throw that out to you. But body mass index, even though it is imperfect, it is a good, easy way to give you an idea about whether you have too much fat or too little fat. But another one of the exceptions is if you're an athlete. Athletes are big, but most of that bigness is muscle. You know, so the fact that uh, they may have a higher body mass index than I do does not mean that they're overweight or they have more adipose tissue than I do. Most of their tissue is muscle. As I get older, my muscle gets less and less and less. Okay, so again, just, just to keep that in mind. So that, that's... For the sake of argument, and this, this is some data that was for some years ago, where, where is obesity throughout the country? Roughly, just roughly, just roughly. Uh, right, and you can tell that a lot of it is based in the South, that uh, again, 30% is obese, 30 to 35% uh, is obese, above 35% is excessively obese. And as you can tell, most of that Midwest and South, and a lot of that has to do with what you eat. But as we're going to talk about, and, and where this is going is, this really is in your genes. This is mommy and daddy and grandma and granddad and great-grandma and great-granddad. It's in your genes. And we, we'll, we'll talk a bit a, a little more about this later. So let, let's, let's, let's sort of summarize a little bit. Overweight is less than 30, right? It's the body mass index 25 to 30, but less than 30. Obese is over 30, okay? But more and more people in this country are becoming more overweight 
consequently more and more people end up becoming obese because you tend to gain weight as you get old. Why? Because you have less, less muscle, you probably exercise less, do, do less on and on and on and on. Obesity is treatable. Uh, you don't have to get do a lab test to figure out whether you're obese or not. Uh, and frequently it can last a very long time or even for your entire life. So what's the whole point about this, Chalk Chalk? What, 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 what are you trying to say? If you are obese in general, it is not your fault. You were born that way, chances are. Now, having said that, you have habit, you can have good and bad habits, and you can have habits that make that worse and make it better. But the majority of the people who are obese, body mass index above 30, the majority of that comes from their genes. It does not 100% come from their lifestyle. Does lifestyle influence it? Absolutely, absolutely. My point is that we need to stop body shaming people because they're overweight or obese, bottom line. Think about that. Think, think about if you are a 15-year-old girl, and I guarantee you, I, at least in, in my, <laughs> my experience, when I was a teenager or going through those things, I, I hated mid-school, mid middle school. Now, I wasn't obese, but I, I just didn't like it. My, but my point is that kids, particularly teenagers, young adults, are going through all sorts of stuff. Teenagers are going through all sorts of stuff because of hormonal changes. Uh, the last thing one needs is to feel like you are less than somebody else just because of your body mass index. And so what, what we recommend is taking what we call the holistic approach, uh, which means that uh, if someone is overweight and indeed you do not want them to become obese, uh, you wanna work with them in terms of exercise, in terms of diet, but not in terms of they are bad people with poor impulse control uh, who, who don't know how to stop eating when they should stop eating. So why, 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 does this, why does this really happen? Well, let's go back to the brain, right? And, and we almost every single talk, we, we started with the brain. Let's, let's look at the six lobes again, the frontal lobe, the frontal part of the brain. Uh, which controls thinking, memory, behavior, and movement. Parietal lobe controls touch and language. Occipital lobe controls uh, eyesight. The cerebrum, which controls coordination. The brainstem, the purple, which is what allows us to sleep and move around and breathe uh, uh, and still breathe and function while we're asleep because we don't have to be conscious to do it. And then, of course, the temporal lobe in the blue. Uh, and that's where we have learning and hearing and feelings. The temporal lobe is where the amygdala lives. And those of you who've been in the uh, class before know what I'm talking about. Okay, here's the amygdala in, in red, but we're not gonna talk about the amygdala today. We're gonna talk about the food control center in your brain. Your brain does have one because all of this is set aside and put into your genes and there are, again, a billion, a, with a B, neurons in your brain that do all these things at the same time. As I said before, think of the brain as the, the ultimate supercomputer that never stops uh, and does a lot of different things. The important thing to know is that the new control center is basically the hypothalamus. And let's, let's see, how, how does that work? How does that really work? Well, and this, let me, let me show what this is. This is the brain. This is a hamburger. <laughs> These are fat cells. They're, they're yellow in color, and they normally are yellow in color. Um, I, you know, one, one of the things, that's, as a surgeon, the body, it has beautiful colors once you get past the skin, <laughs> right? I'm sorry, I, I know you, you might have to think about that for a bit. Because I'm, I'm a surgeon, right? So all, what I do is cut people. So what, once you cut people and open things up, er, everything else looks the same. The gallbladder is a pretty blue-green. The, the blood, of course, is red. Blood in the vein is blue. Um, the fat cells are bright yellow color. So, so this is what adipocytes of fat cells look like. But what I want to show is that the fat cells in our bodies 
secrete a hormone called leptin, L-E-P-T-I-N. This hormone goes to the brain and in, in effect says to the brain, stop eating. You've had enough. And then you stop eating. Now, if, if, if that leptin does not work the way it's supposed to work, uh, when you're sitting at McDonald's, instead of stopping at that first hamburger, you may eat three more hamburgers because your, your leptin didn't, didn't, didn't tell you to stop, right? What prevents the leptin from working properly? It goes back to the fat cells. If you are overweight and, and let's say obese, you also produce another hormone called C-reactive protein. And believe it or not, that protein goes up and it blocks the leptin to prevent it from getting into the brain. So it prevents you from stop eating. It allows you to continue to eat and eat and eat. Now you may say, well, does that ever change? Well, yeah, it can change, but it's very hard to change. You can change it. You can lose weight. You can just not stop eating. You, you can go back to that control center, that frontal lobe, and you say, I will not eat for the next 30 days. I'm sending a command out from the top, from the control center, frontal lobe, no food. I'm going to fast, no food. And the body's going to say, okay, I don't know. But hey, you are the control center. If you say no eat, we don't eat. But pretty soon the body starts reacting to that. So what, what, what's my point? My point is that this is all organized, it has nothing to do with you. We all have it. We all do it the same way. We, it, it, it works in all of us. And it works one way in some of us and another way in, in others of us. But it is not unique. It is not special. It is based on our genes, based on our genes. And if you doubt that, look at mom and dad, if mom and dad are obese, and look at the kids. Are the kids obese also? I suspect they might be. Because uh, it may not have to do with necessarily their diet and exercise. Diet and exercise is important. We're going to talk about that. But it is not 100% the reason. Let, let's look at this again in a similar fashion. Same brain, hypothalamus, the food control center, fat tissue, yellow color, leptin is reduced, and basically goes to the brain and says, one hamburger is enough. Don't eat two. Right? So you stop at one. You said, I'm full. I'm full. I'm full. I, and I would submit that if, if, if someone were to try to give you two or three more hamburgers, it, it would turn you off. It's, oh, I, I, I can't eat anymore. No, no, please. Now, now, you, now it's, it's bothering my stomach, blah, 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 blah. Because the brain is spoken. The brain is says, I'm done. That's enough. Right? But this is controlled by your genes. By your genes. You have nothing to do with your genes. They come down from mommy and daddy, grandma, granddad, all the way down your family tree. Now you may say, well, can I override it? Well, yeah, you can. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. And as you know, the term yo-yo diet uh, comes because people can lose it. Then they gain it back. They lose it. They gain it back. They lose it. They gain it back. Now, there are other things that can happen. You know, you can have illness and other things can happen to you. But the point I want to make is there is treatment for this. There's treatment for this, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years. Ozempic. You've heard it advertised on television. I know Ozempic. Da, 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 da. Come on. I know somebody's heard that on television, <laughs> right? Ozempic is a medication, a semiglutamide, uh, which is used specifically to decrease obesity. Now, as a part of that, the treatment re uh, uh, requirement for it is you have to be diabetic. Thank you. Uh, is that you have to be diabetic. But, but my point is, there is medication that can help with this. I can remember, again, lessons my patients have taught me, I can remember 30 years ago, I said, oh, doc, I wish there was a pill I could take. I wish there was a pill I could take. You know, and I said, well, yeah, Mr. So-and-so, yeah, but I'm, I'm afraid we don't have any. And all those stuff you see on television, those people coming by and knocking on your door, you don't want to take those pills. Do not go across the border to Mexico or to Canada. You don't want to take those pills. You don't want to take those pills. Because if that was the perfect pill, we would all take it. Well, there are, there are good pills now that are FDA approved. 
for the treatment of patients with morbid obesity and who overweight. It does exist uh, and it can be handled um, uh, under uh, medical management. Wegovy is another medication. And what's interesting, and the reason why I put these two together, both treat obesity, okay? But the insurance will only pay for Ozempic. It will not pay for uh, Wegovy. Or to put it another way, it will only pay for Ozempic if you are already diabetic, which doesn't make sense. Um, but it won't, it won't cover Wegovy at all, right? So who, who takes Ozempic? Movie actors take it, actresses take it, people with money take it, blah, 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 blah. Um, um, Wegovy does, works just the same. As a matter of fact, they're the same drug. They just have different names, made by a different company. Same drug, exact same drug, exact same drug, okay? Ozempic costs about 1,300 something dollars per month, per month, which is why most people don't take it. I can't afford $1,000 a month for medication, that's crazy. So the reality is though, medication like Wagovi, which is the exact same thing, there's a big push to change this. There's a big push to change this. Um, and part of what we get into, we may have a topic on this called healthcare disparity. It is not equal. It is not equal, okay? But we can make it equal. And there are a lot of us who are fighting to do just that. So let, let me sort of summarize that a different way. Your health, if, if you are diabetic and you are obese, uh, and you qualify, your physician can write a prescription for Ozempic and you can take it that will help with your obesity um, uh, and will also help with your diabetes. But if you are just obese and are not diabetic, uh, insurance companies in general will not cover it. Again, which makes no sense. But weight loss industry is a billion dollar industry in this country, you know that. Every January, you see all these commercials and all these 20 year olds on, on gym equipment and all that sort of stuff say, you can look like me if you just do blah, blah, blah and go to blah, blah, blah for six months every day, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. It's all hogwash in my opinion, in my, in my humble opinion. But, but the point I wanna make is there is hope with this. This is a change in my 50 years of practice. 50 years ago, this was not available. This is not available. Uh, one, one of the things that one of the, the healthcare disparities or uh, the way this is used to uh, hurt or abuse individuals is to say, well, you know, um, um, uh, people look like us because we're just smarter and better and do this and do that. But the reality is, no, you can afford to take the Ozempic and other people can't. You aren't smarter or better or, or anything like that. But that is changing. One, one of the actions that you will hear more and more and more, primarily because of the weight loss industry, is that obesity causes 100% diabetes. That's not true. That is not true. And folks have used that to beat up on parents about their children and to beat up on men and women about each other. You know, if you don't do this, you're gonna get, you're gonna get diabetic. If I scratch my head and it rains outside, it does not mean that me scratching my head made it rain outside, right? Correlation is not causation. Let me say that again. Just because two things occur at the same time does not mean that one thing caused the other thing. But a lot of times folks will use that and they say, well, if, if you weren't blah, 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 you wouldn't be diabetic. Not true. Maybe your father was diabetic. Maybe your mother was diabetic. Maybe your grandfather, your grandmother, blah, 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 blah. Maybe it's in your genes and it doesn't matter what you do, right? Uh, so again, we, we, knowledge is power. And, and the people who tend to be, get beaten up on the most tend to be those of us who are not in that majority 80%. Right, you know, uh, and so they said, "Well, you you need to be like us, and and this wouldn't happen to you," and that's that's just not true. Obesity fact: obesity is mostly inherited. It is mostly inherited. It is not because you 
a bad person and you can't control your eating habits. It is mostly inherited. Obesity can be controlled with medication. That's new. That's new in the last, you know, uh, 10 to 15 years. Multiple medications are out there to do it. And as we said before, correlation is not causation. I want you to remember this later. As a matter of fact, I, I want you to, when you get home, <laughs> I want you to take that, 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 that hand computer and I want you to look her up. I want you to look her up. This is Dr. Fatima Stanford at, at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and Dr. Stanford had made, has made a reputation for herself and some other people too, um, but made a reputation for herself because she is what we call a, an obesity medicine specialist. So my point is that healthcare, one of the great things about healthcare is that it gets better and better and better over time. And one of the reasons it gets better over time is that we get more and more and more specialists in more narrow areas. When I started medical school or my internship, there was no obesity medicine specialist. You know, we said, well, no, just go out and diet and exercise. What's the problem? Problem solved, next patient. No, 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 it's not that simple, right? We need people like Dr. Stanford, and there are many like her. Um, and as, as a matter of fact, so go, go, going, going back to your assignment, and I'm not gonna check it, but your assignment is, I want you, when you get time, to go into your browser, whichever one you use, you know, uh, Bing or Google or whatever, and put in Dr. Fatima Stanford, comma, uh, obesity, okay? And her name will pop up and you can read all of her work and all the articles and blah, blah, blah. She's an international obesity specialist, not just in the United States, because obviously the obesity in the United States is different from the obesity in Mexico, which is different from the obesity in, in, in Canada and Europe and on and on and on and on and on, right? Um, the other thing I want you to do is I want you to put in your browser 60 minutes, the show, 60 minutes, comma, obesity. I first heard about Dr. Stanford in January of this year. I heard to see it before in my life. And 60 minutes did a program on obesity. And I said, hmm, this is interesting. Uh, and, and you will get to have her tell you what her belief system is, and others like her. It's not just her, but others like her. But I encourage you to do this. I encourage you to do this. Other reason I encourage you to do this, that the other purpose of this masterclass is we're planting seeds here. We're planting seeds. This is not just about the, the, the material that, that you review. We're planting seeds. Why? What, what do I mean by that? Uh, I, I want other Dr. Stanfords to come from your family. Get my drift? I, I, want, I want your sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters to be a Dr. Stanford, to go to Harvard Medical School and come up with some, something that changes the world the way she's done. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, President Joe Biden just appointed her, I think, uh, a couple of months ago to some big commission in the White House uh, because she's such an international specialist. Uh, so my point is medicine evolves. A lot of stuff that we knew 30 years ago, we know better now. Uh, and obesity has good treatment opportunities, and it is mostly uh, caused by um, genetics. Summary, body mass index. It's important, and I would encourage you, the other thing you want to do with your, your handheld computer is put in BMI African American, BMI uh, uh, Mexico. BMI, um, uh, Korean, on and on and on and on and on, okay? Most obesity is caused by genetic. Now, let me be very clear. You need to diet and exercise, okay? I am not saying, you know, that throw, throw the bike in the, in the thing and <laughs> hang up the shoes. And, no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, please continue to do that. I'm saying that and that alone is not the only reason why we are the way we are. That's all I'm saying, okay? Do not stop your good habits. Please don't. They said, well, you know, I'm no longer gonna exercise. It was like a child says, this is my daddy's fault. <laughs> Done, 
No, 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 you're not done. You're not done. So please don't, don't, don't do that. Uh, men, women, and children are different. Now, I didn't spend a lot of time with children because they're a completely different area in terms of evaluating body mass index. And that alone would be one, one presentation by itself. But again, you, you can look that up. Do not shame individuals. Remember the very first presentation we did was on mental health issues. Uh, and a lot of that came from pressure uh, and things that we say about people, uh, whether intentionally or not, that ends up being harmful and hurtful. Um, and you don't know what folks are going through. You do not. I, I remember um, uh, one time I heard <clears throat> an individual said, there was a guy who wrote a note, <clears throat> excuse me, and he said, I'm gonna walk to the bridge and I'm gonna jump off and kill myself. But if one person speaks to me on the way, I won't do it. And as the story goes, he walked to the bridge and he jumped off and he killed himself. What's my point? My point is you do not know what other people are going through. You're not supposed to know. None of your business, actually. But always, always, always be that person, be that beacon to help and not hurt, okay? Um, we have a thing that we all swear to when, when we um, take the oath of medicine, and it's called um, procreary non nocreary, a uh, premium non nocreary. Um, anybody know what that means? Take a guess. Any nurse, any nurse I know, first, do no harm. First, do no harm. And so I, I would suggest that to all of you. First, do no harm. If you can't say something about somebody that's going to help them, don't say anything. And, and our parents taught us that. I mean, we, we remember that. Grandma taught you that. If you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything. Right? Right? So wh whether you say it in Latin or whether you say it in English, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but first, do no harm. So, so if you're with someone or you're helping someone or they're helping you or whatever, you're in a group, don't do any harm. Don't do any harm. And what can do harm the most is what we say. Or maybe it's the way we say it, the tone, the attitude. These are little things that many times can maybe stop that next person from going to the bridge. You know what I mean? And it's one of the reasons why I speak to everybody. Now, that's the way I grew up in Nashville, down south. You speak to people. You know, that, that's just what you do. I remember when I when I was in when I was in New England, um, or when I was um, uh, in Connecticut specifically, I would go out and play tennis with a guy on Saturday, and I'd see him on Monday, and he wouldn't speak to me in school. I'd say, I don't understand. I I just spent three hours with that guy on a tennis court. <laughs> but my, my point is, it depends on the culture. You know, some cultures can speak. You know, keep them themselves or whatever. But down south. You know, whatever you call people, hi y'all, how you doing? Hello. And people say, do you know him? I said, no, I don't know him. But he looked at me, so I spoke to him. <laughs> so just, just, just sort of keep that in mind. Certainly do not do any body shaming. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do it for the young people. Don't do it. If you have children, don't do that to your children. You want to really create a problem for your kids. You have the people who they respect and care for the most, mommy and daddy who they believe the most, say negative stuff to them repeatedly over and over and over again. And what, what, what do you think happens as that kid gets 15, 16, 17, 18, 19? You think they forget? I guarantee you they don't forget. Okay, so, so please just, just sort of keep that in mind. Medication can treat obesity. We can fix this. We can fix this. And that, and that is all over. And indeed, uh, and Dr. Wachovi, uh, the, the lady that I show you, uh, she's one of the main people um, um, who's, who's pushing to have equity in terms of pricing for, for the medication uh, and to make sure that it's available to all people. But sometimes it's sort of like one class of people want to push down the other class of where you're poor and you're obese and you're diabetic and you got poor health habits and blah, 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 and it's all your fault. And that's just not true. My basic principles, almost done. God is in charge. No bad days. Life is too wonderful and too beautiful to have bad days. Do not sweat the small stuff and most stuff is small. 
all that little stuff that's bothering you and usually something every day is bothering you, let it go. Let it go. Number one, most people don't care. I'm being honest with you. Because I'm, I'm your instructor, right? So I can tell you the truth. Most people don't care. Let it go. And it's really not as big a deal as you think it is. You know, I, I go back to what I, I would get a C in chemistry. Oh, no, I'd get a D in chemistry. And I said, oh, my God, if I don't pass chemistry, I, I can't graduate and I can't get into medical. It's like my world would come apart. You work it out. You figure it out, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. True story. Um, um, the only D I got in college. True story. Tennessee State University, Nashville, Tennessee. Oh. <laughs> the only D I got in college was in swimming. I cannot swim. And the instructor says, Mr. Chacho, swimming is a requirement to graduate. I said, oh, my God, I got to go to medical school. <laughs> and he said, okay, okay. I, I, don't, I guess the guy felt sorry for me. He said, Mr. Choctaw, he said, if you can get from that end of the pool to that end of the pool, I will give you a D and pass you. And I said, Mr. So-and-so, I will get. <laughs> and I did. I, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> I, I got my D proudly. Proudly. I worked for that D. Uh, but my point is, you can figure it out. It may seem impossible. It may seem that, oh my God, how am I going to do this? Remember, principle number one: God really is in charge. You know, and He said, "I'm here. Just talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me." Um, forgiveness is therapy. I, I learned this one. You know, so if you always sort of down and you know stuff like, may, maybe you need to start forgiving some people. Just saying. And, and it doesn't matter what the details are. Nobody cares about the details. Just say, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. It's okay. It's okay. I love you anyway. Whatever, whatever the words you want to use. You will be amazed at how that will lift the burden off of your shoulder. Not off of theirs, they say. Off of your shoulder. Because you're the one carrying this stuff, right? And most of you don't even know what you're going through. In, in your head, I mean. They, they don't know. All they know is when they say something to you, you snap at them or you do X or Y or Z type of thing. So just keep that in mind. And everything is a relationship, mutual respect, mutual trust, good communication. Any questions? Yes, sir. Oh, that's an excellent question. His question is, why is medication for obesity so expensive? Uh, and, and the answer is because people want to make money. That's the only reason. Point us. Seriously, that's the only reason. They do it because they can. And so if I control, if I make Ozempic and I'm the only one who makes it, I can put any price on Ozempic I want. But if he starts making Ozempic, now I got to look at maybe lower my price because he's now competing with me. So that, that's really what's, what's going on here. And that's why getting the White House involved and the President of the United States involved or whatever, to go in and say, no, 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 no. This is not in the national interest. We recognize the fact that obesity is a big cause of healthcare problems. And so we're, we're, we're going to sanction you if you don't lower that medication. And, and that is changing. That is changing. Yes. Sometimes when a person is going through a weight loss, they will um, they will kind of level off, and it, no, and you know no matter what they seem to do, they're just kind of stuck in that that space where they're they're not gaining but they're not losing. That that's an excellent question. The brain is recalibrating. Excellent question because this you know I I may have made it seem like it's very simple, but the brain does. I don't know, I'm going to say a million calculations. And it's doing all sorts of stuff. As, as you are saying in your frontal lobe, I want to lose weight, mm -hmm. so I'm going to eat less. And the brain is, is trying to get out ahead of you and it prepares stuff. And so it, it may stop you from losing weight for a while until it sort of catches up. 
and then it then it then it lets you lose it lets you lose a little more. So so you're doing this in conjunction with your unconscious brain, and and the brain is really what's in charge. Uh, and and that's why many times you can't always command it to do X and it'll do X. It may do X plus one, but it may not always do X the way you want. I started with a paleo reset. Yes. And and. And you know, with prayer and, and meditation yes. and, and changing yes. some things, and mm -hmm. and I'm at this place where my my weight has plateaued. Yes. And I'm still need. I'm still interested in 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 making some adjustments. So I did. I started walking two miles a day this past okay. week to try right. to try to kickstart it. Right. Is that going to work, or do I just no, need to? Well, be it, exercise is always good. Always walking two miles is good, no matter what. Uh, but sometimes it takes a while, which is to your other point, that this, that we, we, we want it like right now. Uh, and the brain is saying, no, 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 I don't work that way because I've got 5 billion things to handle here and I can't just do this overnight. So a lot of times it takes a little longer, but I would say just stay, stay the course that you are because you're on a good healthy course. You're doing what you can do within your time frame, And, and that, that's for you, I think that's the best way to do it. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh huh. You know, like doing lit services sometimes. That's what I'm saying. You know, you, if you want to fast, you can or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. But I went to the Bible and I saw that Jesus fasted for 40 days. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea to get doctor or counsel before you try anything that extreme, right? I mean, because if that's, I think maybe like five days will be good, maybe. I mean, there shouldn't be any self-fasting. There shouldn't be any self, you know, you don't do it yourself. You go to the doctor and you pray. It's not like, oh, this is good. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take it on, on myself to do it. Go to the doctor first, right? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> I mean, Hey, keep in mind, I'm a doctor, so so whatever I say, just put, you know, keep it in mind. Uh, it scares me when 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 people do forty days, whatever, um, because my first thought is, can you do that? No. R rephrase: Should you do that? And many times, the answer about whether you should or should not do that is that conversation between you and her and your doctor, and whatever she tells you. You know, she says, okay, Dr. Choctaw, uh, you've done good here, but you need to do a little more work here and you're doing fine here. So maybe not 40 days, maybe 10 for you and we'll modify whatever. I, I think that's the best approach. I'm always worried. I'm always worried when mentally or consciously the brain says, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, <laughs> we're, we're gonna go climb that mountain. You know, and and the the other things to saying, you know, I broke my leg two two weeks ago, uh, and I'm not sure I can really climb. You, you know what I mean? And sometimes there can be a disconnect because the the conscious part wants to do what the conscious part wants to do. You're in control. You're the CEO. You know, you're in control of the brain, but the brain may not always be able to do what you want it to do. Um, you know, and so it's important, I think, to get. To, I I don't think you lose anything by by doing that. Um, and so I think it's always good to do that. And even if you don't talk to a doctor, talk to your spouse or a good friend or a buddy or somebody who says, well, you know, I think I'm going to do blah, 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 blah. What do you think? What, what, one of the challenges uh, that I've had, maybe challenge may be too strong a word, is that I would take care of a lot of patients, many of them Christians, many of them St. Stephen uh, patients, who would say something to me like, you know, Dr. Chaka, I feel like I'm failing. And I said, well, what do you mean you feel like you're failing? I said, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be a strong Christian, and, but yet I'm scared and I'm worried. And I said, you know, Mr. So-and-so, it's normal to be scared and worried. It has nothing to do with whether you're a strong Christian or not. Or they would say, well, should I just pray on it and put the surgery off? And I said, no. <laughs> and I would say, do both. Pray and have the surgery. Who says you have to pick and choose? Who, who told you you couldn't have it both? You can have both. That's why God put all this stuff here. You know, this is not accidental. Uh, so my point is that um, always do what is reasonable and what is in the best interest mentally and physically. 
Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's fine. That's okay. It's okay. Um, I honestly feel really blessed to be here. I'm here from Pennsylvania, um, my uncle, and visiting my uncle and aunt. So I, today, this is like a godsend. So thank you. I'm, oh, no, I'm thank thanking you. God for this divine appointment. Um, <laughs> but my last question is, um, the whole thing about water, you know, there's this whole weight loss thing around water. Could you touch on that? Sure, sure. Uh, no, water, water has no calories, but water is just water. Okay. That, that, there are no nutrients in it. Uh, there are no vitamins in it. Um, and you can live for a while before you die on just water, but only for a while. The body was not intended, in my judgment, to live on water alone. You got to have more than that. And, and that's, that's what scares me a lot of times, because there are all sorts of things that sound good and with all the bells and whistles or whatever, but at the end of the day, it can be more harmful than good. So if anything just doesn't make sense to you, then, then just don't do it. Yeah, this, yeah. this whole thing about a gallon of water a day, yeah. to keep your weight. All that does, is, it, it fills you up. I can remember when I was growing up, uh, you know, very, very early, we didn't have a lot of food, so we would drink water. You know, our mom would have us drink water to go to bed, so we would have something in our tummies. But, but, but that's all it does, you know, it's just water, yes. Hydration is definitely important. Oh, the, the question was, is hydration also important? Uh, uh, hydration is definitely important, but not just hydration alone. It does not substitute for calories. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. What is ketosis? Ketosis, okay. Because ketosis. that's something that I hear now everywhere. Ketosis, now, ketosis is, a, is a chemical process in the body where after you eat food, that food is broken down a certain way into its component parts, so then it can go to the different parts of the body where it's gonna do its job. Now, one of the problems occurs many times in patients who are diabetic, where that process may not be as effective as it should be, uh, or it may be overly uh, aggressive, ends up causing problems in the liver, causing problems in the kidney. It is a normal body process. That, that helps us to be able to function. Uh, yes. And that it has to be to eat a lot of proteins. It is important to eat a lot of proteins, but again, there are three main food sources, uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So those, those three should be eaten in, in balance as compared to doing all of one, all of another, all of another. The diet, excuse me, the diet should basically be balanced. A lot of people start losing a lot of weight when they start ketosis. And I'm, I'm so happy thinking. you brought that up. Again, you can lose weight. If you go and sit on a rock and not eat anything, you can lose weight. If you drink water and only water, you can lose weight. And the issue is they gain it back. Some of you who are old enough to remember Oprah and her genes. Remember Oprah and her genes? Remember, remember, she said, oh, I'm going to get in those genes. I'm going to, and she did get in those genes. She was dancing around the TV set, but it didn't last. <laughs> I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, let, let's put it in for two, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, and I think it's okay to have, uh, to have goals. I think goals are good. Because there's a way to do it a little bit at a time, a little bit. I think that's good. But I think you have to be realistic. And I'm going to say the majority of the stuff that we hear is not true. It's, it's just not true. Okay. Dr. Choctaw? Yes. I have a question for you. Uh, why is it that you can gain weight in just one specific place of your body and nowhere else? And that's one place you might be trying to get it off. Okay. A lot of times, depending on your, your body uh, habit and the way your body is set up, and this could certainly be genetic, uh, where you gain weight and the weight appears to deposit in certain areas of your body um, as compared to other areas, that tends to be more genetic than anything else, quite honestly. Now, what, what people do, uh, certain people who go to plastic surgeons and that sort of thing is they they basically go in 
uh, and attempt to have those areas removed. You know, people have uh, liposuction because they want to get rid of the body fat. Um, um, others have enhancement or removal of fat. Now, some people go and they want the fat moved around because <laughs> they want it in certain areas <laughs> as compared to in other areas. Uh, my suggestion is not to do a lot of rearranging with stuff. You know, God is really pretty good at what he does. Uh, but, but to answer your question, that's probably most likely genetic. Dr. Chakta, how much yes. does insulin, how, how much does insulin resistance have a, a effect on people's weight gain? Excellent question. Uh, insulin resistance is a major problem with weight gain because one of the ways that having a lot of fat makes us more likely or influences us to become diabetic is that it makes insulin less efficient that the, the body produces the right amount of insulin, talking about adults, normal adults, but the insulin doesn't have the same effect. And it's that insulin resistance that ends up tending to make us uh, more tending to become diabetic. Thank you, excellent question. Any other questions? Is that a question online? Sister Sukum, thank you very much again. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, Sister Sukum. And to all of you, happy uh, Resurrection Weekend. Um, I know that you're all superstars and, and leaders because very few people will come out on a Friday, on a Saturday morning <laughs> doing, doing Easter. So thank you so much. And again, don't, don't forget your handheld computer. Don't forget your handheld computer. May God bless you. Uh, Pastor Rebus, could you uh, dismiss us with a word of prayer, please? So we can take care of uh, of the temple that you have given us, and also to be help help whatever we go, uh, delivering all this information, Father for your honor and for your glory. We thank you for every who was here, uh, personal and those on uh, different platforms, oh Lord God. Bless themselves, bless their family. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. 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 Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chantal. Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you all very much.